everyone to another edition of our Phenomenal Women of 2021. I am here with Nicole. Nicole, please introduce our, yourself. Tell us about who you are, your business. We want to learn more about you. Well, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity and having me here. It's uh, incredible to be able to connect with other business owners who are doing incredible things and making change, especially in the financial services industry. Um, but I'm Nicole Mayhofer. I'm the managing partner and chief operating officer of Aurelian Capital Partners. We are a minority and women owned wealth advisory firm. We really operate in a boutique capacity and we service professional athletes, exonerees, high net worth individuals and high income earning individuals. And obviously as a woman, I'm really proud of what we're doing. Um, in addition, my minority business partners, together we are trying to change the face of finance and bring wealth, uh, bringing access to investments and the ability to really create generational wealth uh, to women and minorities. In that's, a, that's amazing. No, that's, that's really amazing. Um, I think the one I'm sure you know, because you probably get a lot of questions about this. So you mentioned, you know, athletes, high net worth people, but you also said exonerees, which I know for me, that's not um, a client group that I hear about. So I'd love to hear more about that because that's super interesting. If you don't know what an exoneree is, it's somebody who's been wrongfully convicted of a crime. They've dealt with the worst injustice that they could have ever been dealt. And they spend anywhere from five to 20 plus years in prison and they work to, uh, you know, either uh, they, you know, go out there and try to get people to hear their story who then help them get out of jail through, you know, obviously uh, legal battles and appeals. And then after years of this process, they walk out of jail and they're free for the first time in sometimes decades. And with that comes a whole host of, of problems. There's not enough support for them when they walk out of jail. They sometimes don't have family to go to or don't have people that they can count on or people are trying to take advantage of them. So what we are trying to do is support them. So a lot of these exonerees then go and sue you know, the states and win big settlements. You know, No amount of money can make up for the time that they spent in jail wrongfully convicted, but it is a way for the state to say we were wrong here is you know this this large sum of money for you to try to do your best to live a normal life and what happens is that time when they get out of jail to when they actually get that settlement is a really very scary time because you know they don't really have money they take out loans to support themselves because they can't get a job they haven't worked you know, they don't know. So some of them don't know how to use, you know, computers. They, you know, and a lot of our exonerees are some of the most giving, intelligent, you know, smart people who just want to do good, but they don't have the tools to do that. And so we really try to step in and support them with helping to manage, you know, some of their litigation loans, helping them figure out how am I going to spend this and help them with the basics of what it means to have a bank account and how to spend money and how to budget. And then when that money does come in, we really step in and help them make the most of that and, and make it last and make sure that the money that they received is not, you know, is, is not gone right away. You know, that we can step in and really be their, their life support to say, hey, listen, you know, this money needs to be invested. We need to look at it and make sure that, you know, you're not being taken advantage of because again, these people are so giving, they have the biggest hearts and, you know, they just want to give back to their friends and family who helped them when they were in jail wrongfully convicted. And, you know, our, our role is to make sure that they could live their lives and they could really step into what their purpose is and, and you know, really help them define what their empire is going to be in this life after innocence. That's amazing. That's amazing. I think, I think too often we forget how much can change in a year, let alone 10 or 20 years. I mean, you think about the last 20 years, cell phones become mainstream, home computers become mainstream. Um, you know, the advent of social media, people going online and exchanging ideas and videos and memes and whatever else in real time. 
it's so for a lot of these folks they have no freaking clue it's, it's literally like coming into an alien planet almost I feel like because they they just it's a completely different world than they left mm -hmm. absolutely so with our clients one of the things that we always start with is we're here to help you build your empire we're not here to manage your money yeah, that's what we do because we're wealth managers and we're going to put together a financial plan for you and we're going to make sure you're invested intelligently, but also to make sure that those investments are fueling your empire and helping you build generational wealth that has historically been reserved for white men. Mm, preach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so... I love that you say that because, you know, we talk to a lot of advisors and it's about retirement planning, making sure there's enough, you know, to sustain you through the end of life. But I don't know that so often we talk about creating generational wealth. We definitely talk about, you know, advisors keeping those assets and then serving the next gen. But the but I think that's different from creating generational wealth than just servicing those assets through the next gen. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So I could go on for hours about this <laughs> and <laughs> I really could because, you know, historically in the, the wealth management space, it's exactly what you said. We're worried about saving for retirement and we're worried about servicing the next generation. Well, what about creating a plan for your life today that funds your goals and allows you to live with purpose, but also provides for you in retirement and then allows you to leave a legacy for your children or your family, whoever it is, or a charity, uh, whoever it is you want to leave that legacy for. And you know, this is a, get a little personal for a second, but <laughs> there were kind of two pivots in my you know career. And the first one was the most tragic experience of my life that turned into one of the most um, important moments in my life. And that's when I lost my mom tragically. And I realized my parents had worked so hard from, you know, going from poor to being able to have a support their family and create the life that they created for us. And then the most important thing that they focused on was saving for retirement. I mean, that's what, what, what they were doing, put their kids through school, save for retirement. And they had all these amazing plans. They were going to travel in retirement. And guess what? That didn't happen for my mom. She, she lost her life before that was possible. And it definitely flipped a switch in me to think, like, why are we constantly saving for retirement and saving for the future when we should be saving to fund our lives today? Because there's no guarantee. And obviously, that's a very, like, sad, I mean, I, I'm, I think it was, again, why, why I say it's one of the most tragic stories, but turned into one of the most important, you know, moments in my life and has really fueled my purpose is because, uh, you know, people need to be able to live their lives today. That's the most important thing, you know, but at the same time, we don't teach in school how to create a financial plan. If we taught every single high school student and every single college student how to create a financial plan, I think our economy and our society would be better off overall altogether, but we don't do that. So what my partners and I are really motivated to do is help people live their lives today build their empires, live their purpose, but also make sure that like they can leave a legacy to their children and they can, you know, continue to live that same purpose and the same lifestyle at the same level that they're living today, you know, when those assets run out. And actually our, our, our professional athletes, uh, it's even more important to do that planning right when they start their careers because their careers are so short. They have a very short window of, uh, you know, wealth accumulation because, Obviously, you know, football players only work a few years in the, in the industry. And so to make sure that we're looking at the whole picture is even more important. No, that's, that is amazing. And it, to me, it almost feels like a generational shift in the thought of how to deal with a particular client's assets. You know, mm -hmm. I come a lot, normally older advisors who are, you know, focused on retirement planning. How can we spend down assets? Um, so that you can rely on, you know, the government to pay for, you know, your, your nursing home stay. And, you know, I'm like, that may work for some people, but part of me is like, you know, I want to be fly when I'm 80, you know, I want to be living it up. And I also want to live it up now in my thirties. So um, 
it for me at least, uh, and, and I'm sure for many people watching, it it really represents a mindset shift in terms of how you guys work internally and then with your clients. Yeah, and it's hard to to shift that mindset, but there's this moment when you do construct a financial plan for a client and you see them light up with the possibilities and the opportunities. And it's one of those moments that is always so rewarding as a financial advisor, because people don't realize what their money can do for them. They think that they are, you know, supposed to be working for their money when really their money should be working for them. And when you start, when you have that mindset set shift, it kind of changes your attitude. It changes the possibilities and it really gives you motivation to keep going. Yeah. yeah. So how, how have you changed the way you do business now through your firm versus other positions you've held in the past? What's been the biggest and most significant change for you? Yeah. So for my partners and I, the biggest change is how we approach our portfolio construction. Now, the typical portfolio construction construction is focused on asset classes and you know you're focused on fixed income, real estate, stocks, bonds, your typical, you know, core portfolio and then alternative invest, you know, alternative investments. But we really focus on your core portfolio and now obviously because our clients are at a higher wealth level, they are, a lot of them are accredited investors. They have the ability to invest in, you know, more risky alternative investments, but we look at it as really the alternative investments and your core portfolio and what percentage makes sense within those two buckets to fund your, uh, you know, lifestyle today and then your future lifestyle. And that's a shift because Instead of going out, and so in uh, previous positions, what we do is we would go out and we would hire different asset managers in the different buckets. We'd have a fixed income manager, and then we'd have a international equity manager, and we'd have a domestic equity manager. Now we're leveraging, and again, this is definitely, you know, the millennials are more comfortable with this, is we're leveraging artificial intelligence to help build those core portfolios. So we just hired an, an amazing new manager who leverages artificial intelligence and they construct our core portfolios based off our clients individual risk level so instead of going out and saying we want an index fund that you know or we want an asset manager that's going to mimic the returns of the s p 500 we go to our uh you know portfolio manager who's you know uses artificial intelligence to build the portfolios based on the risk level of the individual security. So it's actually building portfolios for our clients at the in individual uh, risk level of the security and building custom portfolios based on their specific need. And it's great because it allows us to focus more on going out and sourcing opportunities for those really big riskier invest investments that have the potential to return, you know, multiple uh, you know, a, a higher percentage than, you know, your, your typical core portfolio. That's really cool. Cause I feel like these days more and more advisors are trying to shy away from alternatives, private placements, you know, riskier investments in general, and you guys are embracing it. You're saying this has a place. Um, this can be, a, a, an extremely useful tool in our toolbox of wealth management tools. And um, it's great to hear that. Um, I mean, it's, it's great to hear that you're using our advancing technology to help support your portfolio management. Because especially when you're just talking about risk, you're still doing the things that we traditionally see. You're still minimizing risk, but in a whole new, amazing, technologically advanced way, um, mm -hmm. which is, I mean, I hadn't really heard a lot about advisors utilizing artificial intelligence to make that happen. So when we're talking about making changes in the industry and breaking through glass ceilings and opening new doors, and um, if there is no door and window, getting out your, your knife and carving out a door shape and kicking through it, 
Um, how, how are you guys hoping to kind of lead the charge on expanding the imagination of advisors and showing them like, hey, we are a beacon, we're, we're in a, a, a representation of how you can still be a great wealth manager, but in a completely and different way. Yeah, you know, I, I think our goal really isn't to inspire other wealth managers. We want to inspire the next generation who's coming up, who wants to move into the wealth management space and also our clients and people out there that aren't being given the, the love and respect from the financial side that they deserve. I mean, that's really what our goal is. And, you know, obviously being a women and minority owned firm, you know, standing up and putting our, our faces out there so other people can see what we're you know representing and then also when we're doing business we make it a point to support other women women and minority owned businesses one of the reasons we were so excited to work with you Layla and my RIA lawyer is because you are a women run run firm you hire women you hire minorities and you know you're out there making a difference and that's really what we are attempting to accomplish as well is just making a difference and making sure that when we're choosing, uh, mm -hmm. you know, our asset managers, we're thinking uh, ahead. We're also thinking about diversity and making sure we're supporting other people who have the same mission that we do. And my business partner, Oliver, he has really paved the way in the alternative investment space and created strategic relationships with people who are successful and have a track record of success and are trustworthy in the alternative investment space who are diverse and there's really nothing else you could do besides walk the walk talk the talk and do what you say you're going to do you're going to do and that's what we're trying to trying to do that's amazing i love hearing that story every single time so we've talked a lot about the breakthroughs you guys have made in your business you know, from the use of artificial intelligence to kind of this mind shift, shift change, even just a breakthrough in terms of the kinds of clients you service, you know, not just the athletes and the high net worth, but exonerees and how instrumental you are to these people's lives that are coming out. And sometimes they don't even have support systems and you are the support system that they have to learn, you know, how do I uh, how do I manage my litigation? How do I manage money? You know, simple things like how do I rent a home or buy a home? Um, I know your conversations go a lot deeper and often get very personal, um, especially with your exonerees. So how are you hoping the industry will continue to change? What would you like to see change in our industry moving forward? I just like to see more access for women and minorities. Be in more education, you know, our industry needs to realize that it starts with education and ends with wealth creation. And the more we inspire the next generation to step into this career, it's still not easy for women. It mm -hmm. is still a terrible place for women. And the stories I hear from, from colleagues who are still working at other, you know, companies or who are completely getting out of the industry because they feel so defeated, it's heartbreaking. And the, the same goes for, for minorities and especially minority women. You know, they have had the most difficult time during sort of going down a tangent, but they have had the most difficult time during this pandemic keeping their jobs because they have to take care of their children. So I think I'd like to see the industry acknowledge that and get out there and make a difference and inspire people to and support them and allow them to be able to have the time and the space and the energy in the runway. Because a lot of times what happens is you get into wealth management space and you're completely discouraged because the expectations of running your own book and getting business and that's the focus. And it's not so much on allowing the person to grow, develop, mature, and learn along the way. If you're not somebody who's going to go out there and get the business right away, a lot of the times the doors are shut on you, you know? And definitely when I started my career, I was not somebody who went out there and was able to get all this business and bring people in. Like I'm definitely, I definitely focus on more the operation, the education, and just continuing to focus and stay true to that has allowed me now to get to this place where I am 
you know, able to generate clients and am able to be, you know, kind of the face of, of finance for women. But to get here, it, it wasn't a straight line. It was really difficult. And I was lucky enough to have, you know, partners along the way and people who supported me and allowed me to have that space and time to get to this point. Whereas men typically have that, you know, mentality where we're going to go out and get the business. You know, women are different. So the path needs to be different for women. Mm-hmm. Well, I think too, when you think about it, our industry is, has been traditionally male driven. So when we, when we look back to the 50s, 60s, 70s, the traditional family model was the wife stayed home with the children, the men went to work and supported the family. So the kind of structure in terms of compensation and growth, um, I kind of think of like the law firm partner route. It's yeah. very traditional in the sense that it's all about, you know, your time and bringing on new clients, et cetera. But we're not in that kind of, of, old school family structure anymore. The world has changed. Most households require two working parents to support their family of, you know, 2.2 kids and a dog, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's not feasible for many families anymore to just have one household income. So when you're having women in the industry, there's no one at home to take care of the kids, you know, unless they're lucky enough to have a high enough income to have daycare for their kids or their kids are old enough to be in school or they have a nanny at home. Um, but otherwise in this kind of, of like COVID is the perfect example, how many women left the industry because their kids had to do school from home. Um, and it's kind of, we have to fit back into that traditional model. Can we talk about numbers for a second? Because yeah. a lot of people don't like to talk about the numbers and One of the things that I like to do is encourage people to get really uncomfortable and talk about it. So let's talk about childcare for a second. Okay. Before the pandemic started, I was lucky enough to be in a position where I had a nanny share with a dear friend of mine. And it was great. We shared the cost. You know, it was about, you know, I live in Chicago, so it was about $1,200 per person per month. And when COVID hit, things got very complicated. And all of a sudden we, you know, found ourselves in situations. I actually, we actually, my husband and I actually moved to the suburbs, like everybody else in the, you know, in the, in the country during COVID, we moved to the suburbs and ended up having to find childcare and cover the costs ourselves. And our costs went from $1,200 a month to $2,000 a month. And I think for most people, that number is absolutely shocking. And, you know, I'm lucky enough to have a career. My husband's lucky enough to have a career but how can people afford that? You know, and that's why women are leaving their jobs to stay home because they can't afford to pay even a thousand dollars a month in childcare. Yeah. I mean, so what, then how, how, how can you expect them to stay on that career track? Exactly. Then? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, what has your experience been with, with childcare and being a entrepreneur? I'll definitely say, Having worked at, you know, in-house for, for companies and, and um, being an associate of law firm, the, having my own business has definitely given me the flexibility I could never have anywhere else. Ever, 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 <laughs> ever. <laughs> um, you know, especially through a worldwide event like our pandemic, right? The idea of like, hey, my nanny, um, you know, can't work today because she's sick. Or, hey, my kid's daycare is shutting down uh, because there's concerns with COVID and parents are scared. I mean, especially March, April, yeah. my kids were in a daycare and the daycare shut down. They had to, you know, clean everything. They didn't know what was happening. The, our, you know, I'm in North Carolina, so our state shut down um, in phases, different businesses. Um, so we were forced to find child care outside of the daycare system. And... Not, okay, so you talk about childcare before our pandemic. The prices skyrocketed because the demand went out the freaking door. Yes. So um, someone who may have taken 15 bucks an hour before wants 35 bucks an hour now. And you're right, you and I were in a position, our spouses are in a position where we can potentially pay these increases. But I know a lot of women who are younger, just getting started in a career, and they have to immediately step back because it's not just about the cost of childcare. You also have to look at taxes. There are women I know who stop working because they're paying more in taxes by having a job 
than if they didn't have the job at all. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's really hard. And then when you're talking about, you need to have, you know, a certain number of years experience, you need to have a certain AUM level, um, or, you know, whatever else, it's really difficult to do that because when it comes to the family, when it comes to children, women are the first to take up that responsibility. So in a circumstance like this, women are going home to take care of their kids and do the virtual learning. And then a lot of these companies are not set up and weren't set up and weren't prepared to have people work virtually. Now, I think there are a lot of companies who have figured it out, but then what are they doing to invite these women back in? Be like, hey, we know you had to leave because you had familial obligations. We now have an infrastructure that can allow you to work remotely. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's, it's like a two-part failure. There wasn't the support system for when, when, when family needs are a priority. And there's not a system now to bring these women back in and put them back in the role they were in. A lot of times we're seeing them having to start over or take on a lower paying, less tenured position. Mm-hmm. And that's wrong. I think that's wrong. It's, it's, it's terrible. To add to the question you asked earlier, what is our firm doing to you know, make change? Your specific question was in the financial industry, but one of our pillars is giving back to the community, Mm -hmm. doing that in a few ways uh, through investing in real estate, uh, companies that are developing real estate in low income areas of the city of Chicago. And the second thing that we'd like to start doing is helping minority women get their jobs back and find childcare to be able to support them in their career. Those, right, you know, that is, I mean, I could talk for hours about it because minority women were the ones who, who, you know, were the worst hit in all of this. And it breaks yeah. my heart. We, we, we are, we are here talking about it and I want to see more people actually doing something. I personally want to do more, you know? And so if anybody has ideas on how we can come together to, to, to you know, support these women, I do have one idea though. Our firm, we are in talks of, you know, later this year, we will bring, be bringing on, uh, you know, a few people. So if there are women out there who have financial background, have a financial background, are, and are interested in and in, in need to get back into, you know, the wealth management space, send me a note. I'd love to talk oh to you. Oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> I love it, Nicole. So for, for these people, how do they contact you? How do they get a hold of you? Yeah, so they can, you know, they can email us. Uh, my uh, email address is should I give my email address out to the to the world? Right? Yeah, I can. You can if you want, or if you have like a general inbox, yeah, like an good. info at, you can do that, or you can have them connect you with LinkedIn. Yeah, um, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. It's Nicole Meihofer, M E I H O F E R, or Oliver Coupe, K U P E, or Cameron Dickerson, and we are part of Aurelian Capital Partners. Send us a note, and we will reach out to you. That's amazing. That's amazing. And it, it just takes one, right? It's a tsunami. It's a, it's like, it's like at a sports arena with the wave. It starts with like the couple of kids that get it going. And before you know it, the whole stadium's doing it. Um, yes. So yeah, it's important. I think it's amazing that you're making this offer. I think it's amazing that you're doing this. I hope other firms out there will take note um, about what you guys are doing and how you're helping out. Cause you're right. Women, minority women, certainly most affected as if sexism, racism wasn't already doing it, you know, on top of it, kind of all the the old school societal infrastructure we have in place that we have to tear down. Um, So it's great to see you guys doing that. And I hope more and more firms look to you guys as an example of how you can conduct business in this space um, while still serving your community and, and doing better. We have to do better. You're right. It's an ugly place for women. It almost took me out. So I get it. I totally get it. Same. Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah. I'm, we're so inspired by you though. And the decision that we made to hire your firm was the single best decision that we've made um, because of the importance of, of compliance. You know, we definitely want to lead with compliance and do what we need to, to make sure that our firm can be here and yes. we're doing it the right way to support our mission. So thank you for, you know, just stepping in and helping us navigate. Yeah, oh, it's, we're grateful. 
It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for helping exonerees. Thank you for um, providing this opportunity to women and minorities. Can, can I say can I say yes, of course. I didn't mean to cut you off. That's totally, you know, not a, uh, yeah, whatever. But <laughs> no, this is all about you. But there's just one thing that I think women who are starting off or who are in their roles, whether it's wealth management or not, there's really three things that they should keep in mind as they progress. Just be confident. Mm. Be confident. Don't second guess yourself. Mm -hmm. And then surround yourself with the right type of people, the people that are going to support you and who are not going to bring you down. And if you do those, those three things immediately, you will see success. I agree. I agree. Definitely. It's, it's really important to surround yourself with the right people. Mm -hmm. And if your friends are critical and harsh and not supportive then you're, they're not your friends. You need to, you need to get with our phenomenal women yes. um, and join that network. Um, yeah. Cause we all, we all know those bitches that don't support other women. <laughs> um, listen, oh, Nicole, conversations with you, they're always so amazing and it always gets me so pumped up. Um, cause you're living it. You're the living, breathing example that a woman who's married, who's got children, can start her own business, can serve her community, can do business in a way that helps people. It's different. It's, it's um, you know, it's the future of the industry and still be able to meet your own personal and professional goals. I mean, that's amazing. So Nicole Mayhofer, Aurelian Capital Partners, LLC, reach out to her on LinkedIn. Thank you for being one of our phenomenal women of 2021. You are, you're a gem. You're one of a kind. Oh, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure. And, you know, I'm honored. Right back at you. Thank you. All right, everyone. Nicole Mayhofer, our phenomenal woman of 2021. Take care, everyone.